Well, I'm now at the 10 month stage since starting building my Bearhawk aircraft. And this last month's been particularly busy. I've done a lot of work on the avionics and engine wiring. The seat belts have gone in, the exhaust pipes are now on, and a number of other things. Come and take a look with me. So last month, I'd had a problem with the exhaust pipes fitting properly and they were touching the side of the cowling. So I spoke to Clint at Vitamin Exhaust and he suggested that I send them back for some reshaping. I did that. Uh, it took about four weeks and uh, in fact Clint completely remade the exhaust pipes. You can see them here, they, they now fit perfectly actually and they've got a ton of clearance. He's done this by reshaping them. Uh, one of the flow on effects is that the heat muffs here that provide the cabin heated air are about one inch further aft. You can see looking underneath there's plenty of clearance between the heat muffs and the pipes themselves and quite a large air gap for the cooling air to exit the cowling. After fitting the exhaust pipes, I went ahead and fit the exhaust gas temperature probes. They are located uh, approximately two inches down from the outlet on each pipe. They're actually quite easy to fit. You just drill a hole and uh, they're held in place by a hose clip. Now this is the upper nose cowl and uh, a couple of weeks ago I made up the oil dipstick access door and I really enjoyed making that up. Um, works very well. I ordered some parts off the internet. I, I, I bought a, uh, a hidden hinge, what they call a hidden hinge and a small Cessna type latch and uh, it springs up into place and then very simple to close. You can do it all one-handed and it locks into place. Now I may have a little bit more work to do on it. The, the way I've designed it is so that when you're filling it up with oil that the, the access door springs out of the way. But it does occur to me that being a pressurized cowl the corners may be forced up by the pressure inside. If that happens, I'll need to add some strengthening inside, probably in the form of fiberglass or maybe rivet in place a small aluminium brace, something like that. Now, one of the major projects of the last month has been the avionics and the engine wiring, and I enlisted some help. Uh, Kelly from Canterbury Avionics spent three days with me here working on the Bearhawk, and I was very, very glad to have Kelly come and uh, help me out. So at this stage, I'm just finalizing all the wiring. It's all in place, all the lugs are crimped on, everything's up and running and it's all been tested. We've turned the radios on, the VHF, we did some practice transmissions, everything's working there, it's tuning up properly. Um, the Dynon screens were already working and all, all of the uh, avionics was in the rack uh, about six weeks ago. That part of it was all working, but it was all the probes and transducers and things like that that needed to be wired in properly. I could have done it myself, it would have taken a bit longer, but I had all the wiring looms made up and in place for Kelly ready to go. The wiring is that I decided to move uh, this transducer block up here. It was just on the other side of the engine firewall. I've moved it over here. That probably was about a half day exercise and there was a number of reasons why I did that. The main one being there's just more room over here and I refit all of the uh, transducer hoses in place and that's where we permanently wired it into. One job that I hadn't done until yesterday, in fact, was uh, the backup batteries for the EFIS. There's one on each side. Now, I'm not actually convinced that I need them. Um, they're nice to have. I'm not sure that they're a need to have. I did speak to Jonathan at Advanced Flight Systems, and he pointed out that each EFIS, if it receives a big enough voltage drop, say during engine start, for instance, will automatically take itself offline, shut down, and then reboot when the voltage is sufficient. In my mind, that says if you're flying VFR, Perhaps you don't need the backup battery. Anyway, against my better judgment, I've put two of them in and uh, I, I was running tight on space up here in the avionics rack. So what I did in the end is I've, I've mounted them down in this lower section of the boot cowl. There's actually quite a lot of room in there and they fit really well. It also means they're very easy to access both from inside and from outside because this is a removable panel. I'll just climb up here once again and you'll be able to see what we've been doing on the inside of the avionics racks here. There's a ton of wiring, and once Kelly had finished uh, doing his side of the cabling, a lot of the wiring looms were already in place, and I spent several days with cable ties and cable wraps, just tidying everything up, and I'm very, very happy with how it's come out. On the inside of the engine firewall, this is on the starboard side, we've now permanently connected um, the lithium battery to the vertical power primary power system. And that's working really well. So this black box here, the PPS, that contains all of the normal contactors that you would see on the firewall and uh, the equivalent of the shunt um, for getting the amperage. One thing that I really wanted to do was to add a ground power plug. I've done that. It's actually on the inside of the firewall just above the rudder pedals. So if I do need to jumpstart the aircraft, the last thing I want to do is to have a cowling open 
and have to access the jump leads from outside the aircraft, particularly if I'm by myself. So I've come up with the idea of, of putting the ground power plug on the inside of the cabin, on the firewall. I don't need to have the cowling open for it. I can jump start the aircraft, pack the jump start pack into the back seat and carry on. One thing we did when installing the ground power plug is we've, it, it's held in place by two bolts. One of those bolts has also become the main uh, ground or earthing lead for the aircraft on the firewall and that worked out very, very well. So in the nine month up, update, I had done a lot of work on the, on the wing root panels. Everything was in place, but the panels themselves weren't in place. And I've now gone ahead and finished that. We've installed them permanently. They're, they're held in place by small machine screws and I used riv nuts uh, into the forming structure. So here's a closer look from the outside. Up here, you can see the passenger headset sockets. This is the front seat uh, passenger sockets up here, complete with a Limo uh, plug for Bose, and uh, that's the back side of the ELT plug. Here's a view from the inside. You can see up above the steel structure itself is where all the headset jacks are located. I've now installed the fuel sight gauges, very happy with how they turned out, and I've got the ELT switch located there as well. I wanted the ELT switch out of the way of people's legs, that sort of thing, but I wanted it in full view and easily accessible from both seats, and this is uh, in direct uh, eyesight from the left-hand seat and very easy to reach. At the aft end here, you've got the passenger uh, headset plugs. So one thing I've given a lot of thought to was the seat belts. Now, the back seat itself, nothing special there. I've just gone for lap belts only. I do have to say that if I was doing this again, what I would do is I would install inertia reels up uh, off the tubing up here. And there was some debate uh, on the Bearhawk forum about how to go about that and whether it would need strengthening. I don't think it does need strengthening for the very simple reason if, if that is good enough with lap belts only, having shoulder belts as well is even safer. So yeah, if I was doing it again, that's how I would do the back seat. That said, I'm very, uh, very happy with how they've come out. I got them made up here in Christchurch and uh, they've done a very, very good job. One of the things that you notice, and I, I'd never really paid a lot, of, a lot of attention to seat belts before, but with a lap belt, it has to lock. So that uh, locking action is taken up by the seat belt plug itself. Now, front seats are a whole different ball game. Um, you do need uh, some sort of retention on your, on your shoulders, and a lot of people tend to go for a four-point or a five-point harness. I thought about that for a little bit and then decided not to. I, I was very keen to see if I could use a, a car seatbelt system. Look, car seatbelts are in use all over the world. There's just millions upon millions of them. I'm thinking to myself, why can we not do something with these in the aircraft? So I like the idea. So I went down and visited the local seatbelt suppliers here in Christchurch, New Zealand, Fidimont Seatbelts. These guys were excellent. It's a family owned company and you just get top level service. So we came up with this idea of why don't we use the plug off a lap only seatbelt, take that off and put it on a diagonal shoulder belt with an inertia reel. Now, when you think about it, if you don't do that, if you have it just a normal car seatbelt, that's fine most of the time, but if you start bouncing around in turbulence, there's nothing to hold you down into the seat because you can't lock the lap part of it. So I wanted to be able to lock the lap part all of the time that I'm in the aircraft, but I want the shoulder to only be controlled by the inertia reel. So we've managed to get the best of both worlds. I've used a diagonal automobile seat belt running off an inertia reel, but we've put a lap belt plug onto it. It's fully adjustable until you do it up. Once it's done up, you can tighten it, but you can't loosen it. If you want to loosen it, you undo it, make the adjustment, and then plug it back in, cinch it tight across your lap, and then it will hold you very, very uh, tightly into your seat during turbulence. Now, one thing that the guys at Fittimon Seatbelts pointed out to me is that the inertia reel contains a ball bearing, and the, the action of the ball bearing is to lock the seatbelt any time that the inertia reel is on an incline. It works in uh, cars, you know, that frustrating inability to pull the seatbelt out when you're parked on a hill. And the problem we've got here is, well, this is a tail dragger. It's always on an incline, so it just wasn't going to work. And they said, well, we can remove that ball bearing from the inertia reels, and they've done that. So now, any time that you exceed the G-force, it will lock, and the rest of the time, you're free to pull the seatbelt out. That was very important to me because I need to always be able to reach the flap handle and the fuel selector down on the floor of the aircraft. Now, that, this is one thing that I'm going to have to fully test out in turbulence during the test flying phase. At this stage, we're fairly confident it will work, but we won't know 100% for sure until it's been tested. 
Now I did have a little bit of a setback during the month. I was working on the skylight. I've done a lot of work on the skylight and I decided to make it out of a Lexan panel. Um, in fact, this Lexan panel here, this is the one. So uh, went to work, cut it to shape, it actually cuts quite well with the angle grinder, um, drilled the holes in it. I used a, a, an electric drill that I had blunted the drill bit on and put it into place. Um, also, you can see I've added some uh, adhesive backed felt onto the front and rear edge. It's captured on all four sides. But what happened was about five minutes after I'd finished mounting it, I noticed some small cracks had appeared around the, uh, the screw holes. I had been very, very careful not to tighten the screws much at all. In fact, they were probably quite loose. So I was a wee bit baffled at first, but there are a couple of reasons why that might have happened. So I spent a bit of time asking for advice from other guys on the forum and that sort of thing. And I've had some feedback on what might have gone wrong. And there's, there's two possible issues. One, one could be that the drill I was using simply wasn't blunt enough and that it's, it's actually cracked the lexin on the way through. But another possibility too, because I didn't want to do the machine screws up tight, what I had done is added some Loctite, and I've discovered since that Loctite simply doesn't play well with Lexan. It's the same with uh, aviation fuel. It crazes it and it makes it very brittle and prone to cracking, particularly in this case where the holes are actually on a, on a bend in the Lexan. If it's going to crack, that's where it's going to crack, and I think that's possibly what's happened. So I plan to uh, go down and buy another sheet of Lexan tomorrow, in fact. Use this one as a template, do it again, and just be a little bit more careful with it. I'll also use longer machine screws and put a nut on the end to secure them rather than using Loctite. Now the back seat on these four place Bearhawk aircraft is, is held in place by four A and four bolts. They work very, very well. What actually happens in practice is when you're flying in the mountains and going to, into airstrips a lot, people tend to take the back seat out. It lightens the aircraft up. They've only got two people on board and they've got a ton of space for carrying gear. So when you're doing that regularly, undoing four bolts to get the back seat out adds a little bit of uh, additional time. And I came up with the idea of using some sort of pin. I've located some off the internet, actually purchased them online here in New Zealand. I'll show you what they look like. So these pins are known as a T-ball locking pin. You simply push the blue button in the center and uh, it releases two ball bearings and you can slide the pin straight it up. Makes removing the rear seat about a two minute job. Also in installing it again is about a two minute job. Once it's taken out, to secure cargo in the back, I can use the seat mounts with the same T-ball lock pins for securing cargo. I've been asked a number of times about the builder's manuals for the Bearhawk aircraft, and there are three or four different builder's manuals. Um, they've been written by experienced aircraft builders who have built the Bearhawk over uh, many years. Some of them are older, some of them are newer, some of them not quite so much up to date. To me, that's all part of the Bearhawk experience. And whilst it would be nice to have one comprehensive manual, you get that with the larger kit set manufacturers. Bearhawk, um, the kit set uh, production, which is owned by Mark Goldberg, and he always consults with Bob Barrows. He produces them down in Mexico City. They're then shipped up to Mark's place in Texas. And, um, you know, there's a personal touch involved with this. And part and parcel as it grows is that the aircraft is evolving. And so one of the biggest assets when building a Bearhawk aircraft is uh, the online Bearhawk Users Forum. Uh, it's worth its weight in gold. There's, there's many, many answers already sitting there. And uh, I sort of interact with it every day or two and quite often pose questions that I don't know the answers to. And I'll have replies from people who have already been there before me and uh, usually within a day. I've done quite a lot of work on the front doors now. You probably remember from previous videos that rather than having the two separate doors, I've uh, welded them together and made one gull wing door. Very happy with how it's come out. And I've got a Kydex panel on the inside of it. Took a little bit of work. This is Mark II or Mark III, I forget how many times. But uh, that's now got the acrylic pane in it and uh, the mechanism works very, very well. This one is the uh, Ford cargo door. Once again, I've put the acrylic in it. That's all held in place, riveted in, and uh, worked very well. You can see here I've installed the uh, rear passenger window on the left side. Once again, just a pane of acrylic rather than Lexan. The acrylic uh, handles chemicals better. It's not as strong uh, impact resistance wise as the Lexan, um, but still nine times stronger than glass. So what, what remains here is there is a small gap at the front. I need to seal that, and I'll probably put a, a small strip of aluminium uh, former down there just to seal it properly. 
We spent a few hours configuring the Dynon EFA so that it reads correctly and uh, mostly it's working pretty well now actually. In fact on this display, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I've got cylinders 1, 3 and 5 uh, EGTs connected up and they're actually showing the temperature here in the garage with the heater running of 14 degrees Celsius. This view shows the engine page layout here and everything's now working uh, correctly. I've got the oil pressure, oil temperature, fuel uh, pressure there as well. All hooked up and uh, reading as you'd expect with the engine on the ground and not running. So I had a bit of fun one morning. It was a very fine day, light winds, pretty cold actually, but I opened the garage door and rolled the aircraft outside. Um, I, I then connected up the ADS-B antenna and also the GPS antenna and put pop them on a step ladder. Got a full signal actually. Here in New Zealand what you have to do is you go on the Civil Aviation Authority website, type in your aircraft registration. Once you search that, comes up with what they call a hex code. Well, I now have an aircraft registration, which is ZKNSB. So I searched that, got the hex code and programmed that into the Dynon. And hey presto, suddenly I've got uh, full ADS-B uh, out as well as in. So I pulled up Avplan, uh, you know, the full moving map display on my phone here. And I was able to see my own aircraft uh, displayed along with all the jets flying overhead, which was pretty cool. One of the jobs I did this month was to add a rounded lip to the lower cowling exit here. It took about half a day, it actually went in quite well. I have to say it would have been a whole lot easier if I'd have done it before I mounted the engine, but pretty happy with how it came I out. I had been waiting on uh, a couple of orders from Aircraft Spruce that did arrive during them this month, and uh, one of them contained the correct length mounting studs for mounting the Hartzell prop governor. So that's now installed permanently. You can also see I made a decision on painting the, uh, the cowling baffles. They're all done. Probably if I did it again, I'd use a two pot mix because I can see this is gonna scratch up pretty easily. But they are all painted. They're all ready to be reinstalled probably within the next week or two. Last week my ELT arrived and I simply strapped that in place. I haven't connected the cable up to the switch yet just to avoid any mishaps. I do have to customize the cable to the aerial as well. One thing I did do was I added a second firewall penetration and you can see it's right behind the engine accessory case there. Very, very difficult to get to, but I decided that it was needed. It became apparent very, very quickly that I was gonna to need to remove the engine in order to do that firewall penetration. So that's exactly what I did. Didn't even give it a whole lot of thought. I just bought the hydraulic hoist in and uh, essentially about one and a half hours later, I had the engine hanging on the hydraulic hoist while I was able to go ahead and make that firewall penetration. It all said and done, took probably about three hours, three and a half hours, something like that. Got the engine back on, uh, on its mounts and everything back into place. Well, I had hoped this month to make a lot of progress with the air intake. Frankly, I didn't even get near that. I've got the Vans air intake sitting there waiting, ready to be cut down and mated to the uh, lower engine cowl. There were just too many other jobs that needed doing. I've made a lot of progress with those jobs. There are still a few more that need tidying up. Um, but I think within the next one to two weeks, I'll be working on that air intake. And that's one of the goals for finishing in the uh, coming month. So there you have 10 months build progress on my Bearhawk aircraft. Uh, look, I still feel like it's going very, very well. I'm still thoroughly enjoying it. I love coming down here into the shed on, you know, each morning with a cup of coffee and having a look at where I'm at, picking a few tasks to work on for the day. What has become really apparent though, is particularly over the last four to six weeks, there are just dozens and dozens of small jobs that just need to be finished. And most days I'm simply picking two or three of those and trying to get them put away. So that's what it looks like after 10 months. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned and I'll do an update in, an, in another four weeks.